Good morning, everybody. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Jessica Roman, and my paper today is titled Any Direction Might As Well Be Forward, an Examination of the Science, Technology, Linguistics, and Philosophy of Ted Chiang's Story of Your Life. Science fiction explores a wide breadth of science and technologies from the galvanism and Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's Frankenstein to time travel with H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. The genre's de development from the pulp era to the golden age further focused on the science and physical laws, but the, but the new wave revitalized the human element with the soft sciences such as psychology, anthropology, and linguistics. By combining the hard and soft sciences to tell human stories, science fiction holistically explores human relationships to each other, our technology, and our universe. Also, the interdisciplinarity of science fiction makes the science, technology, and social commentary of its stories and time accessible to its readers. I argue that one such example of science fiction interdisciplinarity is Ted Chiang's Story of Your Life, whose story is enriched through its use of linguistic technology and philosophy to tell a compelling story of a mother, child, and free will. The story of your life begins with Dr. Louise Banks, the narrator, exploring, exploring, oh, excuse me, explaining that she is upon the most important moment of her life, the moment when her husband asks if she wants to have a baby. From here, the narration is an amalgam of Luis recounting first, counter, first contact with these seven-limbed so-called heptopod aliens and future memories of her unborn daughter's short life. We discover 112 heptopod ships landed on Earth, nine in the United States. Luis's journey with the heptopods begin when she gets a call from the government shortly after their arrival. She is a linguist and representative of the soft sciences. Luis is teamed up with physicist Dr. Gary Donnelly, who represents the hard sciences. They are part of a group of experts recruited to establish communication and obtain information from the aliens. Following their recruitment, Luis begins the arduous process of deciphering the heptopod language with assistance from Gary. This collaboration is the beginning of the interdisciplinarity within the story combining physics and linguistics to learn the alien language. Early in the process, Louise discovers that the heptopods have two variant or diglossic languages they use to communicate. The oral heptopod A, which does not have the same found word structure we, still, we, we use, but still utilize nouns and verbs. Their written language, known as heptopod B, is semasiographic in that it conveys its meaning through signs and is unrelated to speech. As Louise continues to, cont to improve her understanding of heptopod B, she begins to suspect that their language is nonlinear and the heptopods may perceive time different differently than humanoids. In the years the heptopods spend on Earth, the linguists make steady progress in learning their language. The mathematicians and physicists, however, find themselves at a standstill in their discussions. Eventually, there is a breakthrough between the heptopod and physicists via Fermat's, uh, Fermat's principle of least time. Gary explains it is a variation principle in calculus that states a ray of light will take either the minimum or maximum amount of time to run its course through a given medium. While Fermat's principle starts the discussions between the heptopod aliens, and the human physicist, it also aids Louise in her theory of the heptopod language and perception. As these discussions continue to advance, she begins to realize heptopods perceive, like with Fermat's principle, in extremes, or along a path to a known destination. In other words, heptopods know their future, which further, which further supports their unique writing system. Heptopods be complex semigrams, and their intricate meaning required heptopods to know how an entire statement would be laid out before it was initiated. Luis comes to understand that their language is also performative. Even though heptopods know what is going to happen, they must actualize it through its performance. 
Eventually, Luis's study of Heptapod B begins to restructure how she thinks, which she describes as, quote, with Heptapod B, my thoughts were becoming graphically coded. There were trance-like moments during the day when my thoughts were expressed not with my eternal voice. Instead, I saw semigrams of my mind's eye sprouting like frost on a window pane. As I grew more fluent, semigraphic designs would appear fully formed, articulating even complex ideas all at once. The semigrams seemed to be something more than a language. They were almost like mandalas. I found myself in a meditative state contemplating the way in which premise and conclusion were interchangeable. There is no direction inherent in the way propositions were connected. No train of thought moving a particular route. All components in an act of reasoning were equally powerful, all having identical precedents." Unquote. Like human writing, Heptapod B is a writing technology. Luis learns Heptapod B during her work to decipher the Heptapod language and to enable communication between the Heptapod and humans. The result is a change from a cause and effect based consciousness to what she calls a simultaneous mode of consciousness. Walter J. Ong provides an analogy for how the written Heptapod B language changes Luis's thinking and perception in his work titled Writing is a technology that restructures thought, which examines how written language is a technology that affects human consciousness. Ong explains that being literate is something we take for granted, especially in highly developed technology cultures, but it, is actually, but it actually has a tremendous influence on the way the literate mind functions. Ong states, quote, such views as, such views, excuse me, such views of writing as simply a mechanical skill obligatory for all human beings distort the understanding of what human is, if only because they block understanding of what natural mental processes are before writing takes possession of consciousness. These views also, by the same token, block understanding of what writing itself really is. For without a deep understanding of the normal oral or oral oral consciousness, and noetic economy of human time before writing came along, it is impossible to grasp what writing accomplished." Unquote. Ong further supports this by describing the differences between the literate mind and the oral mind it stands from. When we functioned as an oral society, we had to, we had to utilize mnemonic sayings and qualifiers, since the only way to share information and knowledge was through memorization and recitation. Orality did not allow for thinking beyond what was already established. Too much of our mind's resources were devoted to maintaining what we had learned to keep our culture and society from regression. Being, how, being literate, however, provides a means, a technology enabling peoples to record and share their knowledge. They, in turn, acquire more knowledge and their than their ancestors had, which could be passed on more permanently. When we use the technology of writing, we are using a tool, and as we hone that tool, we become more proficient. Ong explained that technology does not just serve as a support, but as, a, but as mechanisms to allow us to grow and evolve in our thought. Writing allowed us to analyze as we, as we were not able to before. For Luis, Heptapod B allowed an evolutionary jump beyond anything outside science fiction could present. Connected to the story's emphasis on writing, technologies, and thought is embodied subjective experience. Thomas Nagel's What It Is To Be A Bat helps untangle the views raised in Story Of Your Life. Nagel's argument centers on the idea of subjective character, which he describes as what it is to be any particular organism. While we could endeavor to behave as another organism, it can't provide an authentic experience. To illustrate this, Nagel uses the example of being a bat. We can imagine or even try to simulate what sonar might feel like, but we still would not know what it is to be a bat. Additionally, to be born with the brain of a bat would be very different from being born with the brain of a human. A bat perceives the outside world through high frequency sound waves and not light, which is radically different from how our brains work. Nagel expounds, even if I could, by gradual degree, transform, be transformed into a bat, nothing in my present constitution enables me to imagine what the experience of such stages of myself thus metamorphosed would be like. 
The best evidence would come from the experience of bats, if only we knew what they were like. Louise describes the same experience when she begins to think like the heptapods do, remarking, quote, even though I am proficient in heptapod B, I know I do not experience reality the way the heptapod does. My mind was cast in the mold of a human, sequential languages, and no amount of immersion in an alien language can completely reshape it. My worldview is an amalgam of human and heptapod. And no, no one other than a heptapod can truly know what it is to be a heptapod even to the extent that she experiences their perception, she can only experience it as her brain allows. Louise clarifies in her new, Louise, Louise clarifies of her newfound perception, does not allow her mind to process any faster, and she cannot immerse herself in the moments, immerse herself in moments as they do. Nevertheless, heptopod B language, like the heptopod B language changes Louise's perce perception of time, which leads to the question of free will. Determinism and free will are central problems interrogated within story of your life. In particular, this is the struggle that Louise grapples with after Heptapod B has restructured the way she thinks by empowering her to see the future. When the Heptapods eventually leave Earth, they do not bestow any radically new advancements and, their reason, and the reason for their visit is never explained. However, for those people like Louise, be it a gift or a curse, life is changed forever. She contends with her perspective, questioning if it will be her happiness or devastation. In the novella's conclusion, the story comes back to its beginnings. Louise must perform her future, despite the heartache it will bring. She answers her husband in the affirmative, and the actualization of her daughter's birth and future is committed. The question of having free will is unresolved within the story, but Chiang explores what it might mean depending on one's perspective on the passage of time. Free will is rooted in the individual agency to make choices from an infinite number of possibilities, while determinism, according to Shirley Ogletree, is defined as one possible non-random outcome of any choice, even though only one ultimate outcome is possible. However, the individual choosing does not know what that outcome is at the time they are deliberating. When Louise begins to realize she is seeing the future because of learning heptapod B, she posits the paradox it creates. If our future, if our future is already written, one could never know it. If one did, they could change that future, no longer making what is known of the future true. If her new with her new perspective, thanks to Heptapod B, Louise knows she is going to have a daughter, she will divorce, and that she will outlive her daughter. Nevertheless, Louise is presented with a choice. She could act to change this future, or she can play her part as the Heptapods do to realize this perceived future. However, perhaps it is because of her altered perception that she concludes differently. Maybe knowing the future and having a perception of what is to come make her want to realize that future and make it true. Louise may have accepted her future, and by extension her daughter's, but she still questions what this past will, <coughs> will ultimately mean for her. She admits at the end, I, from the beginning I knew my destination and I chose my route accordingly. But, I, but am I working towards an extreme of joy or pain? Will I achieve a minimum or a maximum? While Luis's experience turns on a philosophical question built on the interdisciplinarity connections between linguistics and physics, her decision, admittedly one-sided as we not, do not know what it might ultimately mean for the free will of her daughter, is a human response to a difficult situation. Aliens first contact and prophetic abilities can be the basis of any science fiction story, but the interdisciplinarity of story of your life makes it a strong example of the, exe of the genre because its thought experiment can help us to better understand what it is to be human by exploring the deep connections within our knowledge of ourselves and the universe. Thank you.